Chapter three, the dominant primordial beast. The dominant primordial beast was strong and buck, and under the fierce conditions of trail life, it grew and grew. Yet it was a secret growth. His newborn cunning gave him poise and control. He was too busy adjusting himself to the new life to feel at ease. And not only did he not pick fights, but he avoided them whenever possible. A certain deliberateness characterized his attitude. He was not prone to rashness and precipitate action. In the bitter hatred between him and Spitz, he betrayed no impatience, shunned all offensive acts. On the other hand, possibly because he divined in Buck a dangerous rival, Spitz never lost an opportunity of showing his teeth. He even went out of his way to bully Buck, striving constantly to start the fight which could end only in the death of one or the other. Early in the trip, this might have taken place had it not been for an unwanted accident. At the end of the day, they made a bleak and miserable camp on the shore of Lake de Barge. Driving snow, a wind that cut like a white hot knife and darkness had forced them to grope for a camping place. They could hardly have fared worse. At their backs rose a particular perpendicular wall of rock, and Peralt and Francois were compelled to make their fire and spread their sleeping robes on the ice of the lake itself. The tent they had discard discarded at Dier in order to travel light. A few sticks of driftwood furnished them with a fire that thawed down through the ice and left them to eat supper in the dark. Close and under the sheltering rock, Buck made his nest. So snug and warm was it that he was loath to leave it when Francois distributed fish which had first thought over the fire. But when Buck finished his ration and returned, he found his nest occupied. A warning snarl told him that the trespasser was Spitz. Till now, Buck had avoided trouble with his enemy, but this was too much. The beast in him roared. He sprang upon Spitz with a fury which surprised them both, and Spitz particularly, for his old experience with Buck had gone to teach him that his rival was an unusually timid dog, who managed to hold his own only because of his great weight and size. Francois was surprised too. When they shot out in a tangle of the disturbed nest, he divined the cause of the trouble. Ah, 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 he cried to Buck. Give it to him, Bygar. Give it to him. Give the dirty teeth. Spitz was equally willing. He was crying with sheer rage and eagerness as he circled back and forth for a chance to spring in. Buck was no less eager and no less cautious as he likewise circled back and forth for the advantage. But it was then that the unexpected happened. The thing which projected their struggle for supremacy far into the future, past many a weary mile of trail and toil. An oath from Peralt, the resounding impact of a club upon a bony frame, and a shrill yelp of pain, heralded by the breaking forth of pandemonium. The camp was suddenly discovered to be alive with skulking furry forms, starving huskies, four or five score of them, who had scented the camp from some Indian village. They had crept in while Buck and Spitz were fighting, and when two men sprang among them with stout clubs, they showed their teeth and fought back. They were crazed by the smell of food. Peralt found one with his head buried in the grub box. His club landed heavily on the gaunt ribs, and the grub box was capsized on the ground. On the instant, a score of famished brutes were scrambling for bread and bacon. The clubs fell upon them unheeded. They yelped and howled under the rain of blows, but struggled nonetheless madly till the last crumb had been devoured. In the meantime, the astonished team dogs had burst out of their nests only to be set upon by the fierce invaders. Never had Buck seen such dogs. It seemed as though their bones would burst through their skins. They were mere skeletons, draped loosely in draggled hides, with blazing eyes and slavered fangs. But the hunger madness made them terrifying, irresistible. There was no opposing them. The team dogs were swept back against the cliff at the first onset. Buck was beset by three huskies, and in a thrice his head and shoulders were ripped and slashed. The din was frightful. Billy was crying, as usual. Dave and Solex, dripping blood from the score of wounds, were fighting bravely side by side. Joe was snapping like a demon. Once his teeth closed on the foreleg of a hussy, he crunched down through the bone. Pike, the malingerer, leaped upon the crippled animal, breaking its neck with a click flash of teeth and a jerk. Buck got the frothing adversary by the throat and was sprayed with blood when his teeth strength sank through the jugular. The warm taste of it in his mouth goaded him to greater fierceness. He flung himself upon another, and at that same time felt teeth sink into his own throat. It was Spitz, treacherously attacking from the side. Peralt and Francois, having cleaned out their part of the camp, hurried to save their sled dogs. The wild wave of famished beasts rolled back before them, and Buck shook himself free, but it was only for a moment. The two men were compelled to run back to save the grub, upon which the huskies returned to attack on the team. Billy, terrified into bravery, sprang through the savage circle and fled away over the ice. Pike and Dub followed on his heels, with the rest of the team behind. As Buck drew himself together to spring after him, out of the tail of his eye, he saw Spitz rush upon him with the evident intent of overthrowing him. 
Once off his feet and under the mask of huskies, there was no hope for him. But he braced himself to the shock of Spitz's charge, then joined the flight out on the lake. Later, the nine team dogs gathered together and sought shelter in the forest. Though unpursued, they were a sorry plight. They were not the ones who were wounded in four or five places. There was not one who was not wounded in four or five places, while some were wounded grievously. Dub was badly injured in a hind leg. Dolly, the last husky added to the team at Deyer, had a badly torn throat. Joe had lost an eye, while Billy, the good-natured with ear chewed and rent to ribbons, cried and whimpered throughout the night. At daybreak, they limped warily back to camp to find the marauders gone and the two men in bad tempers. Fully half their grub supply was gone. The huskies had chewed through the shed, sled lashings and campus coverings. In fact, no matter how remotely eatable, had escaped them. They'd eaten a pair of Peralt's moose hide moccasins, chunks out of the leather traces, and even two feet of lash from the end of Francois's whip. He broke into a mournful contemplation of it to look over his wounded dogs. Ah, my friends, he said softly, maybe it's make you mad dogs, those many bites. Maybe all mad dogs scared of him. What you think, Peralt? The courier shook his head dubiously. With 400 miles of trail still between him and Dawson, he could ill afford to have madness break out among his dogs. Two hours of cursing and exertion got the harnesses into shape, and the wound stiffened team was underway, struggling painfully over the hardest part of the trail they had yet encountered, and for that matter, the hardest between them and Dawson. The 30 mile river was wide open. It was a wide water defied by the frost, and it was in the eddies only and in the quiet places that the ice held at all. Six days of exhausting toil were required to cover those 30 terrible miles, and terrible they were, for every foot of them was accompanied at the risk of the life of dog and man. A dozen times, Peralt, nosing the way through broke through the ice bridges, saved by the long pole he carried, which he so held that it fell each time across the hole made by his body. But a cold snap was on, the thermometer registering 50 below zero, and each time he broke through, he was compelled for very life to build a fire and dry his garments. Nothing daunted him. It was because nothing daunted him that he had been chosen for the government courier. He took all manner of risks, resolutely thrusting his little weazened face into the frost and struggling on from the dim dawn to dark. He skirted the frowning shores on the rim ice that bent and cracked underfoot, upon which they dared not halt. Once the sled broke through with Dave and Buck, and they were half frozen and all but drowned by the time they were dragged out. The usual fire was necessary to save them. They were coated solidly with ice, and the two men kept them on the run around the fire, sweating and thawing, so close they were singed by the flames. At another time, Spitz went through, dragging the whole team after him up to Buck, who strained backward with all his strength, his forepaws on the slippery edge of the ice, quivering and snapping all around. But behind him was Dave, likewise straining backwards, and behind the sled was Francois, pulling till his tendons cracked. Again, the rim ice broke away before and behind, there was no escape except up the cliff. Perrault scaled it by miracle, while Francois prayed for just that miracle, and with every thong, thong the sled lashing, and the last bit of harness rove into the long rope. The dogs were hoisted one by one to the cliff crest. Francois came up last, after the sled and load. Then came the search for a place to descend, which descent was ultimately made by the aid of rope, and night found them on the river, with a quarter of mile to the day's credit. By the time they made the Hutilinqua and good ice, Buck was played out. The rest of the dogs were in light condition, but Peralt, to make up lost time, pushed them late and early. The first day they covered 35 miles to Big Salmon, the next day 35 more to the Little Salmon, the third day 40 miles, which brought them well up to five fingers. Buck's feet were not so compact and hard as the feet of the huskies. He had softened during the many generations since the day his last wild ancestor was tamed by a cave dweller, a river man. All day long he limped in agony, and camp once made lay down like a dead dog. Hungry as he was, he could, would not move to receive his ration of fish, which Francois had to bring to him. Also, the dog driver rubbed Buck's feet for a half hour each night after supper and sacrificed the tops of his own moccasins to make four moccasins for Buck. This was a great relief, and Buck caused even the weazened face of Peralt to twist itself in a grin one morning when Francois forgot the moccasin and Buck lay on his back, his four feet waving appealingly in the air and refused to budge without them. Later, his feet grew hard to the trail and the worn-out footgear was thrown away. At the belly one morning, as they were harnessing up, Dolly, who had never been conspicuous for anything, went suddenly mad. 
She announced her condition by a long, heartbreaking wolf howl that sent every dog bristling with fear, and then sprang straight for Buck. He had never seen a dog go mad, nor did he have any reason to fear madness. Yet he knew that there was horror, and fled away from it in a panic. Straight away he raced, with Dolly panting and frothing, one leap behind. Nor could she gain on him. So great was his terror, he could not leave her. So great was her madness. He plunged through the wooded breast of the island, flew down the lower end, crossed a back channel filled with rough ice to another island, gained a third island, curved back to the main river, and in desperation started to cross it. All the time, though, he did not look. He could not. He could hear her snarling just one leap away. Francois called to him a quarter of a mile away, and he doubled back, still one leap ahead, gasping painfully for air and putting all his faith in that Francois which saved him. The dog driver held an axe poised in his hand, and his duck shot past him. The axe crashed down on Mad Dolly's head. Buck staggered over against the sled, exhausted, sobbing for breath, helpless. This was Spitz's opportunity. He sprang upon Buck and twice his teeth sank into unresisting foe and ripped and tore the flesh to the bone. Then Francois' lash descended, and Buck had the satisfaction of watching Spitz receive the worst whipping as yet administered to any of the teams. One devil dat Spitz, remarked Perrault. Some day he killed dat Buck. Dat Buck two devils, was Francois' rejoinder. All day damn I watch dat Buck, I know for sure. Listen, some damn fine day, him get mad like hell, and then he chew that spits up on spit him out in the snow. Sure, I know. From then on, it was war between them. Spitz, as the lead dog and acknowledged master of the team, felt his supremacy threatened by this strange Southland dog. And strange buck was to him, for the many Southland dogs he had known, not one had showed up worthy in camp and on trail. They were all too soft, dying under the toil, the frost, and starvation. Buck was the exception. He alone endured and prospered, matching the husky in strength, savagery, and cunning. Then he was a masterful dog, and what made him dangerous was the fact that the club of the man in the red sweater had knocked all blind pluck and rashness out of his desire for mastery. He was preeminently cunning, and could bide his time with a patience that was nothing less than primitive. It was inevitable that the clash for leadership should come. Buck wanted it. He wanted it because it was his nature, because he had been gripped tight by that nameless, incomprehensible pride of the trail and the trace, that pride which holds dogs in the toil to the last grasp, which lures them to die joyfully in the harness and breaks their heart if they are cut out of the harness. This was the pride of Dave as wheel dog, of Solex as he pulled with all his strength, the pride that laid hold of them at the break of camp, transforming them from sour and sullen brutes into straining, eager, ambitious creatures. The pride that spurred them on that all day dropped them at pitch of camp at night, letting them fall back into gloomy unrest and uncontent. This was the pride that bore spits and made him thrash the slow dogs who blundered and shirked in the traces or hid away at harness time in the morning. Likewise, it was this pride that made him fear Buck as a possible lead dog, and this was Buck's pride too. He openly threatened the other's leadership. He came between him and the shirks he should have punished. He did it deliberately. One night there was a heavy snowfall, and in the morning, Pike, the malingerer, did not appear. He was secretly hidden in his nest under a foot of snow. Francois caught him and sought him and called him and sought him in vain. Spitz was wild with wrath. He raged through the camp, smelling and digging in every likely place snarling so frightfully that Pike heard and shivered in his hiding place. But when he was at last on earth and Spitz flew at him to punish him, Buck flew with equal rage in between. So unexpected was it, and so shrewdly managed, that Spitz was hurled back, word and off his feet. Pike, who had been trembling objectively, took heart at this open mutiny and sprang upon his overthrown leader. Buck, to whom fair play was a forgotten code, likewise sprang upon Spitz. But Francois, Chuckling at the incident while unswerving in administration of justice brought the lash down upon Buck with all his might. This failed to drive Buck from his prospective rival, and the butt of the whip was brought into play. Half stunned by the blow, Buck was knocked backward, and the lash landed upon him again and again, while Spitz soundly punished the many times offending Pike. In the days that followed, as Dawson grew closer and closer, Buck still continued to interfere between Spitz and the culprits, but he did it craftily when Francois was not around. With the covert mutiny of Buck, a general insubordination sprang up and increased. Dave and Solux were unaffected, but the rest of the team went from bad to worse. Things no longer went right. They were continual bickering and jangling. Trouble was always afoot, and at the bottom of it was Buck. 
He kept Francois busy, for the dog driver was in constant apprehension of the life and death struggle between the two which he knew must take place sooner or later, and on more than one night the sounds of quarreling and strife among the other dogs turned him out of his sleeping robe, fearful that Buck and Spitz were at it. <laughs> but the opportunity did not present itself, and they pulled into Dawson one dreary afternoon, with a great fight still to come. Here were many men and countless dogs, and Buck found them all at work. It seemed the ordained order of things that dogs should work. All day they swung up and down the main street in long teams, and at night their jingling bells still went by. They hauled cabin logs at firewood, freighted up to the mines, and did all manner of work that horses did in the Santa Clara Valley. Here and there Buck met Southland dogs, but in the main they were the wild wolf husky breed. Every night, regularly at nine, at twelve, at three, <laughs> they lifted a nocturnal song, a weird and eerie chant, in which it was Buck's delight to join. <laughs> With the aurora borealis flaming coldly overhead, or the stars leaping in the forest frost dance, and the land numb and frozen under its pall of snow, this song of the huskies might have been defiance of life, only it was pitched in minor key, with long drawn wailings and half sobs. It was more the pleading of life, the articulate travail of existence. It was an old song, old as the breed itself, one of the first songs of the younger world in a day when songs were sad. It was invested with the woe of unnumbered generations. This plaint by which Buck was so strangely stirred, when he moaned and sobbed, it was with the pain of living that was the old pain of his wild fathers, and the fear and mystery of the cold and dark that was to them fear and mystery. And that he should be stirred by it marked the completeness with which he had arced back through the ages of fire and roof to the raw beginnings of life in the howling ages. Seven days from the time they pulled into Dawson, they dropped down the steep bank by barracks at, uh, to the Yukon Trail and pulled for Deer and Saltwater. Peralt was carrying dispatches, if anything more urgent than those he had brought in. Also, the travel pride had gripped him, and he purposed to make a record trip of the year. Several things favored him, to him, the, him in this. The week's rest had recuperated the dogs and put them through trim. The trail had broken into the country and was packed hard by litter journeyers. And further, the police had arranged in two or three places deposits of grub for man and dog, and he was traveling light. They made 60 mile, which was a 50 mile run on the first day, and the second day saw them booming up the Yukon well on their way to the Pelly. But such splendid running was not achieved, not without great trouble and vexation on the part of Francois. The insidious revolt led by Buck had destroyed the solidarity of the team, and no longer was as one dog leaping in the traces. The encouragement Buck gave the rebels led them into all kinds of petty misdemeanors. No more was Spitz a leader greatly to be feared. The old awe departed, and they grew equal in challenging his authority. Pike robbed him of half his fish one night, and gulped it down under the protection of Buck. Another night, Dub and Joe fought Spitz and made him forego the punishment they deserved. And even Billy, the good-natured, was less good-natured and whined not half so plaintively as in the former days. Buck never came near Spitz without snarling and bristling menacingly. In fact, his conduct approached that of a bully, and he was giving a swaggering up and down before Spitz's very nose. The breaking down of discipline likewise affected the dogs and their relations with one another. They quarreled and bickered more than ever before among themselves, till at time the camp was a howling bedlam. Dave and Solux alone were unaltered, though they were made irritable by the unending squabbling. Francois swore strange barbarous oaths and stamped the snow in futile rage and tore his hair. His lash was always singing among the dogs, but it was of small avail. Directly his back was turned when they were at it again. He backed up Spitz with his wit, while Buck backed up the remainder of the team. Francois, he knew he was behind all the trouble, and Buck knew he knew, but Buck was too clever ever again to be caught red-handed. He worked faithfully in the harness, for the toil had become a delight to him, yet it was a greater delight, slyly, to precipitate a fight among his mates and tangle the traces. At the mouth of Takina, one night after supper, Dub turned up the snowshoe rabbit, blundered it, and missed. It was a second the whole team was in full cry. A hundred yards away was a camp of the Northwest Police with fifty dogs, huskies all, who joined the chase. The rabbit sped down the river, turned off the small creek, up the frozen bed which it held steadily. It ran lightly on the surface of the snow, while the dogs plowed through the main strength. Buck led the pack, sixty strong, around bend after bend until he could not gain. He lay down low to the race, whining eagerly, his splendid body flashing forward, leap by leap, in the wan white moonlight. 
and leap by leap, like some pale frost wraith, the snowshoe rabbit flashed on ahead. All that stirring of old instinct, which is stated periods drives men out of the sounding cities to forests and plain to kill things by chemically propelled leaden bullets, the bloodlust, the joy to kill, all this was Bluck's, only in an infinitely more intimate. He was raging at the head of the pack, running the wild thing down, the living meat, to kill with his own teeth and wash his muzzle in the eyes of warm blood. There was an ecstasy that marks the summit of life, and beyond which life cannot rise, and such is the paradox of living. This ecstasy comes when one is most alive, and it comes as complete forgetfulness that one is alive. This ecstasy, this forgetfulness of living, comes to the artist, caught up and out of himself in a sheet of flame. It comes to the soldier, war mad, on a stricken field, and refusing to quarter. And it came to Buck, leading the pack, sounding the old wolf cry, straining after the food that was alive and that fled swiftly before him through the moonlight. He was sounding the deeps of his nature and the parts of his nature that were deeper than he, going back to the womb of time. He was mastered by the sheer surging of life, the tidal wave of being, the perfect joy of each separate muscle, joint, and sinew, that in it was everything that was not death. It was a glow and rampant, expressing itself in movement, flying exultantly under the stars, and over the face of dead matter that did not move. But Spitz, cold and calculating, even in his supreme moods, left the pack and cut across a narrow neck of land where the creek made a long bend around. Buck did not know this, and he was round of the bend, the frost wraith of the rabbit still flitting before him. He saw another and larger frost wraith leap up from the overhanging bank into the immediate path of the rabbit. It was Spitz. The rabbit could not run. And as the white teeth broke the back of it in midair, it shrieked as loudly as a stricken man may shriek. At the sound of this, the cry of life plunging down from the life's apex in the grip of death, the fall pack at Buck's heels raised the hell's chorus of delight. Buck did not cry out. He did not check himself, but drove in upon Spitz, shoulder to shoulder, so hard that he missed the throat. He rolled over and over in the powdery snow. Spitz gained his feet almost as though he had not been overthrown, slashing Buck down the shoulder and leaping clear. Twice his teeth clipped together like the steel jaws of a trap as he backed away for better footing with lean and lifting lips that writhed and snarled. In a flash, Buck knew it. The time had come. It was to the death. As they circled about snarling, ears laid back, keenly watching for the advance, the scene came to Buck with a scene of familiarity. He seemed to remember it all, the white woods, the earth, the moonlight, and the thrill of battle. Over the whiteness and silence brooded a ghostly calm. There was not the faintest whisper in the air. Nothing moved, not a leaf quivered. The visible breasts of the dogs, rising slowly and lingering in the frosty air. They had made short work of the snowshoe rabbit, these dogs that were ill-tamed wolves. They were now drawn up in an expectant circle. They, too, were silent, their eyes only gleaming and their breath drifting slowly upward. To Buck, it was nothing new or strange. The scene of old time, it was as though it had always been an wanted way of things. Spitz was a practiced fighter. From Spitzenberg through the Arctic and across Canada and the Barrens, he had held his own with all manner of dogs and achieved to mastery over them. Bitter rage was his, but never blind rage. In passion to rent and destroy, he never forgot that his enemy was in like passion to rent and destroy. He never rushed till he was prepared to receive a rush never attacked till he had first defended that attack. In vague vain, Buck strove to sink his teeth in the neck of the big white dog. Whenever his fangs struck for the softer flesh, they were counted by the fangs of Spitz. Fang clashed fang, and lips were cut and bleeding, but Buck could not penetrate his enemy's guard. Then he warmed up and enveloped Spitz in a whirlwind of rushes. Time and time again he tried for the snow-white throat, where life blubbered near the surface, and each time and every time Spitz slashed him and got away. Then Buck took to rushing, as though for the throat, when suddenly, drawing back his head and curving in from the side, he would drive his shoulder at the shoulder of Spitz, as a ram by which to overthrow him. But instead, Buck's shoulder was slashed down each time as Spitz leapt lightly away. Spitz was untouched, while Buck was streaming with blood and panting hard. The fight was growing desperate, and all the while the silent and wolfish circle waited to finish off whatever dog went down. As Buck grew winded, Spitz took to rushing, and he kept him staggering for footing. Once Buck went over, and the whole circle of sixty dogs started up, but he recovered himself, almost in mid-air, and the circle sank down again and waited. But Buck possessed a quality 
that made for greatness, imagination. He fought by instinct, but he could fight by head as well. He rushed as though attempting the old shoulder trick, but at last instant swept low to the snow. His teeth closed on Spitz's for left foreleg. There was a crunch of breaking bones, and the white dog faced him on three legs. Thrice, he tried to knock him over, then repeated the trick and broke the right foreleg. Despite the pain and helplessness, Spitz struggled madly to keep up. He saw the silent circle with gleaming eyes, lolling tongues, and silvery breasts drifting upward, closing in upon him as he had seen similar circles close up, beaten antagonists in the past. Only this time, he was the one who was beaten. There was no hope for him. Buck was inexor inexorable. Mercy was a thing reserved for gentler climbs. He maneuvered for the final rush. The circle had tightened till he could feel the breasts of the huskies on his flanks. He could see them, beyond spits, and to either side, half crouching for the spring, their eyes fixed upon him. A pause seemed to fall. Every animal was motionless, as though turned to stone. Only spits quivered and bristled as he staggered back and forth, snarling with horrible menace, as though to frighten off impending death. Then Buck sprang in and out, but while he was in, shoulder had at last squarely met shoulder. The dark sink urkel became a dot on the moon's flooded snow as Spitz disappeared from view. Buck stood and looked on, the successful tank champion, the dominant primordial beast, who had made his kill and found it good. Okay, that is the end of chapter three, so quick summary. Um, Buck is really coming into his own. He's been pulling the sled, he's doing well. Uh, his feet aren't super strong, so Francois makes him cute little booties to help him out. Uh, but eventually, Buck starts to feel the press for leadership. He feels the need to become the leader of the dogs. And so he starts to challenge Spitz slowly yet surely until we end in the fight for the death and Buck ends up winning. Um, so some analysis of this paragraph that we can see is that Buck really has let go of the southern dog that he is. He's becoming more and more wild. We see him answering the call of the wild and listening to those inner instincts a lot more. Um, this is really one of the first moments that we start to see him completely let go of the dog side of him and start to accept the primordial beast um, and the memories of his ancestors before. All right, good job, guys.